I acknowledge the Gadigal people, the traditional owners of this land on which we meet today, and the waters of the harbour that surround us and connect us to the world. I acknowledge and thank the many Indigenous servicemen and women who have served and continue to serve the Australian Defence Force in times of peace and war. We welcome the representatives from more than 50 over 40 nations this week who have travelled to be here. In a state of a global pandemic, this is not to be underestimated. Thank you for giving your time and investing in our international relationships. To the domestic Australian delegates and the over 650 industry exhibitors in the floor below, thank you for your contributions and enriching the experience. The diversity and richness of conference delegates in Sydney this week is a navigation headmark that I think people watching in the room and online should keep in mind as we navigate through today's conference and then you engage more broadly across the week's activities. Collectively, all of us here, no matter the rank or role, underpin and build our relationships. This reflects in the investment of our organisation's time, the resources and the opportunity cost decisions to attend. This is naval diplomacy in action. It is building trust, building connections and building ideas. No matter our geography, our technology and our environment, people remain the fundamental building block of our relationships and the trust that we build. Carl Sagan, in his quest to understand the universe, once stated that you have to know the past to understand the future and the present. Now, given the two major themes running this week, the maritime domain in the 21st century, a commonality of purpose, and today's conference, Kakadu, then and now, confidence, cooperation and capable, I think it's worth going back in time for a brief recap. Historically, the Royal Australian Navy has engaged in a number of fleet concentration periods to sharpen the collective war fighting capabilities of the fleet at sea and the larger defence organisation that supports it. But in 1993, a decision was taken to expand the scope of the FCP and create Exercise Kakadu. So while the conference will take you over the last 30 years, I thought just as the martial ceremonies, it's worth going back just to look at 1993. My initial thoughts were, wouldn't have been much going on. But it shows you that history has a way of repeating and the complexities of the time. So I'll take you on a snapshot through 1993. The world is now a few years past the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reunification of Germany. Europe has created a single European market Czechoslovakia divides into two nations. A civil war is being fought in Bosnia. Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat have signed the peace agreement on the White House lawns. The US and Russian presidents have signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty too. But later that year, Russia suffers a constitutional crisis and President Yeltsin is using force against his own parliament to quash an uprising. The World Trade Centre in New York was bombed in a terrorist attack and the President of Sri Lanka was killed in a suicide bombing. The US fought the Battle of Mogadishu. China performed a nuclear test, ending a de facto worldwide moratorium on testing. North Korea announced plans to withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and South Africa officially abandoned its nuclear weapons program. At the same time, the South African leaders, Mandela and de Klerk, received the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts in ending apartheid. Devastating tsunamis had hit Japan. Earthquakes in India and Indonesia had killed tens of thousands. Australia had suffered the worst bushfires in its history at that time. National interest rates were around 5 to 6%. Most inflation was running between 2.4 to 4%. In the tech world, the Pentium processor was being introduced. Windows 3.1 had been released. The World Wide Web was born and the Hubble telescope was being repaired. So when you reflect on the geopolitics of the time, natural disasters of the time, and contrast them with today, this was an initiative of Kakadu driven in a spirit of constructive diplomacy, with a genuine need to develop naval forces capable of cooperating and responding to our respective national needs. As they did in 93 and still do today, our navies are called on by governments to provide options across the span of traditional maritime tasks, be they war fighting, constabulary, security, humanitarian or disaster related. The need for effective naval diplomacy and our collective relationships 
is an enduring one. So today we're running four compelling sessions with diverse international representation and each with a distinguished keynote speaker. And there'll be question and answer components to all. So first I'd like to introduce the chair of today's, uh, this morning's panel, uh, Professor Peter Dean. Professor Dean is the Director of Defence and Security Institute of Western Australia, of University of Western Australia. He's an extensive background in military and defence studies. He has been the Fulbright Fellow and Endeavour Research Scholar in Australia, United States Alliance Studies, as well as non-resident fellow with the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. Before joining the University of Western Australia, he was a scholar at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in, in Australia's Australian National University, College of Asia and the Pacific, where he's held numerous positions. He was appointed at the University of Western Australia's first Chair of Defence Studies in July 2020 and the inaugural Director of the University of Western Australia's Defence and Security Institute in March of 21. He's a Senior Fellow at the Perth USA Asia Centre and a Visiting Fellow at the Strategic, Defense and Stu Strategic Studies Centre, ANU. So Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you everyone. And it's just my pleasure to do just a, a very brief welcome before over to our keynote speaker for this morning. I think we're going to have some great panel sessions here today and what we're going to get is a mix of history, international relations and of course a focus on naval diplomacy. My view is that our objective for the day is to think big about naval diplomacy and multilateral exercises. In an era in which the Australian Defence Force has a role to shape our region, in an era of flux, of change and in international competition, this has never been more important. Exercises such as Kakadu can also take on a deterrence role in an era where shaping, deterring and responding can at times all merge together. I believe there is a renewed interest in understanding, measuring and assessing the role of multilateral naval exercises in our region. Of course, the question I'm going to leave you with today to think about as we start off and before we hand over to our keynote speaker comes back to that overall conference theme that Andrew mentioned of a commonality of purpose. I think what we should be doing today is keeping that in mind is what role do these exercises and more broadly multilateral naval um, exercises throughout the Southeast Asian uh, region provide in terms of providing a commonality for purpose for the navies in the region and for maintaining a rules-based international order and stability and peace in our region. So I'll kind of leave it there as my introductory remarks and we'll hand over to the keynote speaker for this morning. So I'd like to invite uh, Rear Admiral Justin Jones to the uh, stage to give us the uh, uh, keynote address this morning. Admiral Jones joined the uh, Royal Australian Navy in 1988, a principal warfare officer with a dual specialisation in surface warfare and advanced navigation. He has served in more than a dozen RAN warships, accumulating a vast amount of sea time during numerous deployments through the Indo-Pacific and extensive engagement around the world. His commands have included the guided missile frigate HMAS Newcastle, the combat support ship HMAS Success, which deployed to the Middle East and Northwest Indian Ocean on Operation Manitou. Rear Admiral Jones has fulfilled various roles ashore, encompassing training, operations, experimentation and force structure. Most recently, he's completed two years as Director General Operations at Headquarters Joint Operations Command. In this role, he is responsible for the Chief of Joint Operations for planning, integration and control of the Australian Defence Force operations. He's a graduate of the Royal Australian Navy College and the Australian Command and Staff College, holds a Master of Management Studies, a Master of Arts and a Graduate Diploma in Defence Studies. He is currently serving as the Royal Australian Navy Commander for the Operation Sovereign Borders Joint Agency Task Force. Admiral Jones. Thanks Andrew and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm back to 1993, in fact walk through the history of uh, Exercise Kakadu seen through Australian eyes uh, and in many cases through my own eyes and experiences with, with the exercise. So the concept of a Kakadu series of fleet concentration periods was first raised in 1991 and discussed with representatives of potential participating nations during a maritime headquarters operational planning tour of Southeast Asia in early 1992. This was reflective of the government's imperative to improve relations with Southeast Asian nations. Indeed, 
while the strategic review of 1993 reinforced the Defence of Australia doctrine, being self-reliance, it also placed a higher degree of importance on supporting broader regional engagement and Australia's strategic alliances. Overall, the strategic review of 1993 assessed that Australia's main strategic focus should be pursued through greater engagement in the Asia-Pacific region. The Gulf War and continuing operations in the Middle East and Australia's contributions to those had illustrated the importance of interoperability between multinational partners and would be further exemplified throughout the 1990s with operations in Somalia, Bougainville and East Timor. Kakadu was one of a number of initiatives, such as the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, aimed at increasing regional cooperation. Now, Andrew's given us a great overview of all the things that were going on in 1993. Exercise Kakadu 1 was conducted in May 1993. It involved 15 ships and submarines, those being the Oberon-class submarines, and 2,000 personnel from Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore and Hong Kong, which was the UK. It was actually correctly titled Fleet Concentration Period Kakadu 1. Observers from Indonesia and the Philippines also attended. Now I was a sub-lieutenant officer of the watch in HMAS Hobart at the time and Hobart was the commander task group for this activity. I'm not going to suggest that I recall a lot about the activity at the time. <laughs> it also included uh, electronic warfare aircraft, anti-submarine warfare helicopters, fighters, maritime patrol aircraft from Australia, New Zealand and Singapore. The Royal Australian Artillery Air Defence Battery was embarked in HMAS Swan and the Royal Australian Navy and Remo uh, Royal Malaysian Navy contributed clearance divers. It was the first exercise to focus on regional cooperation rather than specifically the defence of Australia and sought to build stronger naval and military links in the Asia Pacific region. Some of you might recall the Kangaroo series, albeit that was a joint exercise series. It included exercises as we're all familiar with, damage control, communications procedures, interoperability between air, surface and submarine assets, mine warfare and EOD. Kakadu 2 was held in March 1995. It was twice as large as Kakadu 1 and involved 22 ships, two submarines, 5,000 personnel from Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia and once again Hong Kong and Thailand. It also included observers from the Philippines. Again, the exercise was designed to increase interoperability and regional understanding. The then Maritime Commander of Australia, Rear Admiral Don Chalmers, who went on to be Chief of Navy, set out how Kakadu contributed to regional security. He said, Kakadu is firmly in keeping with Australia's foreign policy. In particular, that element of policy which seeks through regional engagement to have Australia contribute to viable forms of cooperative security based on relationships which reflect a greater sense of genuine partnership. He went on to say that at Kakadu, there has been a blossoming of acquaintances, an exchange of information, procedures and ideas. We have developed our ability to cooperate at sea. Kakadu exercises in 1997, 1999 and 2001 were comparable in size, but the early 2000s saw a rapid decline in participation post 9-11 and our regional partners became more concerned with its internal security and indeed Australia and we were quite wrapped up in operations, continuing operations in the Middle East. I participated in Kakadu 1999 serving as navigating officer in HMAS Arunta. Kakadu 99 provided a number of firsts. 
These included the first time North Asian navies were invited to participate. Previous years involved only Southeast Asian navies. The first full participation of the Philippine Navy with BRP Bacolod City and BRP Recate. The first participation of then Australian Defence Maritime Services with their 2,000 tonne MV Seahorse Standard, which was used as a target towing vessel during the live firing uh, components of the activity. And it was the first participation of two Collins class submarines, HMA ships Farncom and Waller. I recall clearly my own experiences during Kakadu 1999. Firstly, during the initial entry and anchorage into Darwin of a great many participating units. I offered to transfer across to the Indonesian unit, uh, KRI Fatahilla, to assist in their pilotage and anchorage in very unfamiliar surrounds and some significant tidal streams, as anyone who has operated in Darwin will recall. Uh, secondly, uh, I was asked to swap with the navigating officer in HMAS Anzac for two days uh, at the very start of the activity in order to assist the new commanding officer with Anzac class ship handling. Uh, that CO in question was then Captain Matt Tripovich. Moving on, Kakadu 2003 involved 2,000 personnel from five nations. Kakadu 2005 involved 1,700 personnel from 12 nations, many of which, however, only attended as observers. Kakadu 8 in 2007 represented a change in format, comprising, uh, com comprising a seminar for delegations from regional navies and discussions on maritime security issues. Um, once again, I was quite close to this. I was Commander Plans in Fleet Headquarters in 2006 and 2007, and there was a reason for this change. Exercise RIM of the Pacific, or RIMPAC as it is known to many, always occurs in even years. We were looking for efficiency in the fleet activities schedule and also a means to attract navies back to Kakadu. Why not reschedule Kakadu to occur in even years? right after RIMPAC. The various regional nations participating in RIMPAC could return home via North Australia and exercise Kakadu. The idea was sound, but it meant that for 2007 and a great many of invitees, we needed to fill the gap in a transition year where traditional attendees expected some form of activity. So exercise Kakadu 8, 2007, was hosted by the Fleet Commander at HMAS Watson in Sydney from the 23rd to the 27th of July. The exercise took the form of a multilateral seminar involving naval delegations from Singapore, Pakistan, Malaysia, Japan, New Caledonia, the Philippines, PNG, Thailand, India, New Zealand and Indonesia. The aim of the seminar was to further develop a shared understanding of regional maritime security issues among participating navies. It comprised presentations from a number of visitors uh, distinguished in their fields and a tactical floor game that would enable participants to explore the complexities of maritime operations, particularly in the conduct of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions. An, integrable, uh, sorry, an integral component of Exercise Kakadu 2007 was a flag officers forum from the 25th to the 27th of July. Senior officers from Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, New Zealand and Indonesia participated in this forum. The most senior flag officer taking part was then Vice Admiral Dato Mod Amdan bin Kurish of the Royal Malaysian Navy. Chief of Navy Australia visited that seminar on the final day to address the delegates. We had intended to schedule this seminar style format in future odd years while continuing to run the field training exercise in even years. This did not eventuate and the seminar format was discontinued after 2007. However, a Kakadu Regional Commanders Conference was introduced in 2016 
hosted by the Commander Australian Fleet. The conference was run during the harbour phase for unit commanding officers and visiting flag and senior officers. And once again, in my own connections to this series, uh, I spoke at the 2016 Regional Commanders Conference convened by then Rear Admiral Stuart Mayer. The change to even numbered years dovetailing off RIMPAC and a broader invitation list saw the exercise expand to 2,000 people in 2008 and 3,000 personnel in 2010. In spite of the effects of the global financial crisis in 2009, Participation began to wane again, sadly, in 2012 and 2014. In response to the reduced attendance over previous iterations, Kakadu 16 aimed to slowly move the exercise to become a key event in the regional calendar by providing a significant training opportunity for regional nations. The focus of Kakadu 2016 shifted to focus primarily on international engagement. The RAN's primary objective was defined as provide an international engagement opportunity for regional navies showcasing the RAN. The renewed focus on international engagement has revived interest in the exercise as some 3,000 personnel from 19 countries were involved in 2006. Kakadu 18 commitments were from 27 nations, including 18 major units, four minor units, and 17 aircraft. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, as with uh, uh, 2016, Commander Australian Fleet hosted a major engagement event. This Regional Fleet Commanders Conference significantly increased the profile of the exercise with the attendance of many of the regional fleet commanders in Darwin. The exercise aim for Kakadu 18 was to provide an engagement opportunity for regional partners to undertake multinational maritime activities ranging from constabulary operations to high-end maritime warfare in a combined environment. The Royal Australian Navy's exercise objectives uh, the primary was to provide an international engagement opportunity for regional navies showcasing the RAN. Uh, the secondary objective was to provide a minor war vessel training opportunity supported by uh, our uh, Defence Cooperation Program Sea Training Unit. Uh, and our tertiary was to exercise maritime trade operations and effects in multinational maritime environment. As Kakadu has matured over the years, uh, it has gone from what I recall in 1993 as being three phases, a harbour phase, a sea phase, and a returning harbour phase, uh, to a harbour phase, the Fleet Commanders Conference, uh, phase one, force integration training, uh, phase two, free play, with an exercise pause in the middle, and then the post-exercise debriefs. Kakadu 2016, is perhaps best known for the fact that uh, China was invited to participate, and did. At the Fleet Commanders Conference, then Rear Admiral Meade made some comments, sorry, this is Kakadu 2018, not 16. Then Rear Admiral Meade, the Fleet Commander at the time, made some comments that drew media attention. He said, from the smallest island nations to the largest global superpowers, we all prosper from greater maritime security built on the foundation of agreed rules for how all nations behave at sea. Respect for freedom of navigation must be maintained by all nations, particularly through our complex area. While there may be great diversity in our political and economic institutions, as mariners with expansive experience and knowledge of our oceans, we really do understand the sentiment that a rising tide lifts all boats. We thrive together or we fail together. Now, I don't know whether my friend Ewan Graham is in the audience today, but uh, he made some amplifying comments uh, which were published in newspapers at the time. 
He said most of the core problems were at a political level rather than between maritime operatives, whom he described being part of a kind of brotherhood. And he said, I quote, they are like a white uniform cult of the sea. Um, we might like to talk about that in Q&A. Uh, as uh, many would know, Kakadu 2020 was cancelled due to COVID-19 pandemic. Today, Kakadu augments Australia's current bilateral and multilateral engagement activities and promotes greater and more effective naval and military cooperation in the region. I'm going to finish just by listing the number of nations that have participated in Kakadu uh, during its time in no particular order. Singapore, New Zealand, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Japan, the Republic of Korea, France, New Caledonia, India, Pakistan, Brunei, Timor-Leste, Tonga, Hong Kong, UK, Canada, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Fiji, the United States of America, the United Arab Emirates, the Cook Islands, Sri Lanka, Chile, China and Vanuatu. If we want an example of a commonality of purpose, uh, this is one of the finest exemplars that I can think of that Australia sponsors. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, sir. It uh, gives us a uh, great pleasure to be able to invite one of our uh, foreign partners uh, to the stage to uh, present. Captain Ivan Mario is the Director General of the Royal Malaysian Navy Sea Power Centre. He was commissioned into the Royal Malaysian Navy in January 1987 and was qualified as a warfare specialist. He has extensive sea service, including involvement with Exercise Kakadu in 2001 as the Air Warfare Officer embarked in KD Laku. He later went on to assume command of four separate Malaysian Navy patrol craft, a, Laca a Lacasma class corvette and a multi-role support ship. Ashore, he has served in roles as varied as Senior Navy Directing Staff at the Malaysian Armed Services College, Chief Staff Officer Workup Inspection Fleet Operations Command, and as Director Operations at the Malaysian Armed Forces Headquarters. He holds a Master's Degree in Engineering Business Management from the University of Warwick, a Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration, and a Diploma in Strategic and Defence Studies. His current position, as I said, is Director General of the Royal Malaysian Navy Sea Power Centre, and it's our great pleasure to invite you to speak this morning. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. Uh, sir, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, Sea Power Centre of Australia for inviting me for this conference. Uh, for the next few minutes, I will just uh, rattle through what RMN's experience uh, from the first exercise Kakadu in 1993 up uh, until now and our future aspirations. Uh, for the record, in 1993, I think I still had my hair, <laughs> slim, a young lieutenant, <laughs> okay? I was on patrol crafts at that time. Anyway, uh, sirs, ladies and gentlemen, in 1993, when Royal Malaysian Navy first participated in the first uh, multilateral exercise, we were keenly aware that there was an abundance of new experience and knowledge to be gained. This multilateral exercise was seen as an enabler for inter interactions with various international navies, an exercise that was good and for regional and extra-regional strategic engagement, which provided the catalyst for strengthening relations and building trust between countries. Hence, it was an honor and privilege for the RMN to be part of this maritime exercise. The RMN's participation in this multilateral ex exercise is influenced by this pivotal ex factors. First, the exercise was and still is valuable in supporting our government's foreign policy and diplomatic framework, as it has the potential to converge common goals, clearly define shared concerns, and promote mutual trust between the navies of participating nations. Second exercise, with our like-minded particip participating nations, 
will enable us to ensure, uh, explore opportunities and enhance our possibilities of cooperative contingencies, which is to deter, disrupt, and deny the transnational nature of non-traditional threats. Third, the exercise will be an excellent opportunity to enhance our modernization efforts through testing and observing key capabilities and learning new doctrines from other participating nations. For the growing need for military operations other than war, the exercise would be a catalyst and an imperative for the RMN to participate in bilateral exercise, rescue operations and humanitarian aid assistance and disaster relief operations when needed. And lastly, the exercise provided a continuous revolving opportunity to the RMN personnel to upgrade and upskill themselves towards enhancing interoperability capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, sirs, as a confidence building measure and with the rise of non-traditional threats, the emphasis on force modernization and military operations other than war, the RMN's participation in this multilateral exercise constituted one of the most open forms and beginning evolution of military diplomacy and national security. It also present, represented one of the most sophisticated and mutually beneficial mechanism of Navy-to-Navy -Navy engagement. The access was a means in realizing participating countries' foreign policy, security imperatives, and defense diplomacy, which are driven predominantly by political guidance since the Navy is required to fulfill the nexus of political, diplomatic, and social responsibilities besides its wartime functions. In today's context, where uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity are the mainstay of global security and defense environment, defense diplomacy has become more important to us to pursue individual state and collective regional strategic interests. Thus, Exercise Kakodu is viewed as very significant and plays a crucial role in facilitating nature's defense diplomacy. Nature's recognition of non-traditional secret threats is an important rationale for the RMN's participation in this multilateral exercise. The RMN's involvement in this multilateral exercise expands military cooperation in dealing with these non-traditional threats and crimes, which have transnational aspects. Because these trends transcend borders, the RMN recognizes the mutual benefits of working with RAN, the RAN and the other participating navies to curb this threat. The exercise has proven valuable in enabling participating navies to coordinate bilateral responses to various transborder threats, where it benefits ex its benefits extend, exceed beyond the boundaries of exercise itself. It only sends a strong-willed political message to non-state actors that the participating states in Exercise Kakadu have the means and will to deliver a potent response to deter incidents from happening in future. The exercise has also contribu contributed to the RMN's modernization plan by providing opportunities to observe and benchmark other participating navies' evolve cap capabilities and capacities. Following our counterparts in action has enabled the RMN to enrich and change its own doctrines. Training together under a, un a unified command with a common SOP and references and with other nations has de demonstrated our unity of purpose. They have shown we have the collective will and cap capability to increase trust in each other. Strategically, this exercise is in line with our aspiration for a credible partnership, an instrument to enhance trust and has been an avenue toward the confidence building measure. The OCS border exercise, our OCS exercise uh, has given the RMN a unique opportunity to practice long distance deployment and enhance our strategic security and defense relationship. In particular, it has increased our interoperability cap capacity with the RAN and other participating navies beyond the region. The success of participating in this exercise is also a testament for the need for our nation to improve for logistics capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, it's also a very enhancing and uh, the quality of RMN, uh, and it is also a way of enhancing our quality of our RMN's uh, capabilities. This exercise is also seen as a means of giving the Navy people exposure to outside world, the experience of operating with foreign navies, and engaging in cultural exchange and educational activities. 
with the global military apparatus is witnessing significant technology transformation. As technology advances and strategies improve, there comes a need for the Navy to align with these changes in terms of knowledge, skill, values, and abilities. Therefore, one of the best ways we feel to enhance knowledge and skill is through multi-level, multilateral exercises. In a nutshell, getting sailors exposed to relevant and consistent exercises will help the Navy's improve performance and achieve the desired results, both in traditional and non-traditional domains. It was, I also believe that with the ever-increasing change in technology across all defense industries, exposing sailors to new techniques in these advanced technologies will help to increase efficiency and their Navy's effectiveness. In Kakadu 1, the RMN was represented by a corvette and a team of divers. From this humble beginning, we learned our true capabilities and began to expand our horizons. The RMN's participation in this exercise has always been to improve multilateral relations and security cooperation with the RN and to a certain extent with the other, the other participating navies. Accordingly, the exercise has boosted the confidence of the RMN's people. The opportunity to pro provide the RMN people with greater exposure to overseas environments to test their capabilities and improve their international image is a professional imperative for us to participate in this exercise. The confidence obtained from this unique opportunity to interact with the international naval community and deploy overseas has raised the RMN's ability to operate in an overseas environment and overcome logistic challenges. All this is in tandem with RMN's ambition to develop the Navy, its desire to learn from other navies, and increase confidence and interoperability, information sharing, and develop credible partnership. Personally, I feel the XS has demonstrated an unprecedented level of cooperation in many areas and fostered regional climate of trust. It also shows the RMN's growing interest in pursuing international collaboration and cooperation. To conclude, I can, firmly, I can firmly say that participating in this multilateral exercise beyond our normal operating space has genuinely exposed the RMN to a broad spectrum of naval competencies while enhancing cooperation and interoperability in working closely together for the peace and stability of the region. With that, I conclude my opening address. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ol. Our next uh, speaker is Captain Chalmer Buchan from uh, Thailand. He's uh, the Deputy Director of Policy and Strategy Division at the Naval Operations Department, Royal Thai Navy. He joined the Royal Thai Navy in 1992, and his sea service was predominantly spent with the patrol squadron of the Royal Thai Fleet, and includes command of the patrol boats PGM-13 and PGM-14. Captain Boonchan is a graduate of the Royal Thai Navy Higher Command and Staff College and its British equivalent. He has served in a wide ranging areas such as Flag Officer to the Deputy Commander in Chief, Staff Officer to the Chief of Staff and Instructor at the Royal Thai Naval Command and Staff College. He holds a Bachelor Degree in Electrical Engineering from the Royal Thai Naval Academy and a Master of Arts in Defence Studies from King's College London. He's currently serving as the Deputy Director of Policy and Strategy and we invite him to address. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name again is um, Captain Shalom Wood Bunjan. I work as the Deputy Director of the Planning and Strategy Division from the Naval Operation Department. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, to the RAN to make me here in this event among all the participants around the world. Uh, it's my first time in Australia, and of course, it's my honor to be here as a part of the, such an effective conference. Actually, I got my slide. So next slide, please. Um, the presentation has two key topics. Um, the first one, uh, 
I will talk about the RTN experience in Kakadu exercise. And then the second topic, I will touch on how the Kakadu exercise contributes to our mission, which I think uh, this part is key opportunity for us uh, to share some thoughts, perspectives, and of course, some key takeaways. Well, my presentation is approximately about uh, eight to 10 minutes long. Uh, next, please. Uh, talking about our experience, as you may know that the RTN was one of the participants in the first Kakadu exercise in 1993. We are proud of that, and here is some uh, details of our past experience. Please. As the statistics shown on the slide, the RTN has continuously joined the Kakadu since 1993 until 2018 by sending one frigate to join the exercise at each time. The Kakadu 2008 was special for us because the RTN also sent the aircraft along with the ship joining the exercise as well. Unfortunately, sometimes we found uh, difficulties to send our platform. However, the RTN has rated the Kakadu as one of the major multilateral exercises in the region, so we try our best to participate and maintain our training in the exercise. As you can see on the right side table that we sent our observers and staffs oh, for six times that reflect how we value this exercise as the opportunity for our crews to be challenged to the range of maritime activities. Uh, next, please. Uh, the second topic, how the exercise contributes to our mission, please. Uh, generally, the maritime exercise mainly focus on the tactical aspect. Arguably, at the same time, the exercise can also deliver uh, some strategic approaches. So let me divide uh, this topic into two parts. The contribution at the strategic level and the tactical level. As I mentioned earlier, that the RTN participate in the Kakadu 13 times out of 14. The reason behind such an effort is that we believe uh, that the multilateral exercise in this region can pave the way to the maritime cooperation and bring security for the Indo-Pacific region at the end. More importantly, uh, the Kakadu helps confirming the RTN policy, which in particular seeks through the regional engagement as well. Next, please. Uh, at the tactical level, firstly, uh, every single maritime exercise leads to the high level of readiness, the force readiness, in terms of platforms, tactics and personnel. This fact, I believe this is true. This exercise helps us, help us growing capability and partnerships in the Pacific region. The Kakadu has helped us to develop our ability to cooperate well at sea. Our crews have the good opportunity to share the knowledge and experiences at sea, at sea, ranging from constabulary operations to the high, to the high end maritime welfare in such a different environment. More importantly, we get more friends, we make friends, and we believe this, is, this will create a strong pact among the nations and we also believe that everyone will benefit from that kind of relations in the future. 
please. Before I step down, I would like to express some key takeaways as following. First, on the RTN perspective, the Kakadu is fit for both strategic and tactical aspect. We value it and we continue to participate in this exercise. Second, in order to make the Kakadu the greater exercise in the future, we think that these falling areas of training are well fit to the, mo to the modern threats and security environment in the Indo-Pacific region today. First, the exercise planning for the HADR is one of the items that should be commonly considered. Second, because the participants of Kakadu come from different places and different environments, so different people can have a variety of perspectives in the same issue. And we think that the subject matter experts exchange will benefit to all of us. The reason why we, we propose this idea because the SME work very well and effective in the Cobra Go uh, multilateral exercise that we in charge. Uh, third, the maritime contingency planning exercise is another interesting point for us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I come to my conclusion. The RTN had a strong intention to be an effective regional security partner in the Indo-Pacific region. And we believe that maritime cooperation is a key factor uh, to a safe and secure environment in our region. <coughs> and to us, the Kakadu exercise fit for our strategic and tactical requirement. Once again, thank you very much for letting me hear and I'm happy to share some thoughts with you guys through the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to uh, go into a Q&A session. We've got opportunity for the questions to come online uh, through the, the app. Uh, but while we're waiting for the, uh, the first of the uh, questions to come up, perhaps uh, I might ask a uh, question of the chair. Uh, I'll throw to you, Peter. Sure. Uh, given the uh, different perspectives to come through and the complexity of, of uh, yeah, our geopolitical region, the Indo-Pacific, and all the interests of the nations participating, where do you see the power of the narrative, the idea that joins us all together, plays out you know, yeah, across the globe? And how, how is it viewed from others who may not be part of that partnership? Uh, that's a that's a really fascinating question, and I think narratives are really um, important concepts. Whether we're talking about political narratives, international relations narratives, regional narratives, they play into this concept of how we understand the region and how we engage with the region. And I think exercises such as Kakadu and multilateral exercises, and we've seen we've heard from all of the speakers today that talk about the the role and importance of international engagement of forming partnerships and friendships and the maintaining of water at sea and also references to HADR operations and those types of things. If we have a conception, I think, of the region where navies and military services work in partnership with each other for, for a sense of a greater common good, as we, we heard about before, I think that's a powerful inflective on the way that we more broadly understand the international relations of the region. And of course, we know throughout history that um, cooperation is much better than competition. We often, and we know we're in an era now where we're having both cooperation and competition playing out at the same time. So what we're getting, I think, is competing narratives in that space. And the more that we can emphasise that cooperation level of engagement, the more that we hold exercises like this, um, that puts out there that what we're, we're looking towards is that engagement piece. And, and I think I refer to Justin's piece here, he was talking about Ewan Graham's comment about, I was reflecting on the, the cult of the sea. So I'm not sure where I sit in the cult of the sea. I'm the only one not wearing a uniform on this panel for a start. In 1993, at the, the, when uh, the first Kakadu uh, joined, I actually uh, joined the army, so I was wearing a, a different coloured uniform. <laughs> 
and I'm a, an academic and now and not a naval officer, although I, I will say f in my own defence for the cult of the sea, my, one of my key areas of expertise at the moment is amphibious warfare. And I write a lot about that and, and spend as much time as I can on two very large RAN ships where I can humanly possibly do. And, uh, and I also can claim, you know, the fact my sister's a naval officer so I can, you know, gasp in the, bask in the white glory of the shine of the uniform sometimes. Um, uh, and, and as a good academic uh, does, why, why this was going, I, I did look up uh, uh, what sort of cults mean in the sociology, in the Oxford uh, Academic Manual of Sociology. And we do have three types of cults, so it'd be interesting for us to reflect on what the cult of the sea is. Those three types of cult is a mystical orientated illumination cult, an instrumental type which gives inner experience is sought for its effects, or a service orientated type which is focused on aiding others. Now, the last one may seem uh, relevant, but uh, reflecting on how navies work, I think any one of those three could potentially work there as well. Um, but to get, just to swing back around to, to where you were, I think, um, that, that cult orientation, if it is about service orientated types of cult that's fading on, uh, aiding, focused on aiding others, I think that's a really good imperative to come back to where your question started. If we're working on in an international environment um, with a narrative that's around about aiding others and working together as a community, that's a really positive way to reinforce the stability, I think, of the international environment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first question is to Captain Buncha from uh, Thailand. Uh, I guess given the relatively complexity of your geography with maritime interests in the Indian Ocean, South China Sea, complex land borders uh, and that, uh, could you please just expand a little bit further on where Thailand sees the strategic value of its participation in Kakadu? Thank you for thank you for the question. Um, from our um, geography, um, we are stand uh, in the middle of the two oceans, and um, of course, um, our uh, our RTN policy and strategic thought is um, two or triple A, uh, two oceans, three areas, and. I think I think that um, joining the Kakadu exercise have um, something like uh, related to uh, our um, strategic value, as as I addressed earlier, um, and I think and I think that and I think that um, maritime cooperation, as I mentioned, is 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 a key for us, and 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 show our true value for the uh, regional partner in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Uh, I guess just to follow from that, uh, perhaps Admiral Jones, if I could draw on your previous history as a comm train uh, and as uh, the J3. In uh, Captain Bunchant's uh, chat there, he was talking at, towards the end about uh, some of the things I would like to see in the future, the contingency planning and subject matter exchange, the SME aspects. Where do you see that value in what your observations are the most effective training tools and opportunities that we, we sometimes just let go or we haven't learned our lessons of the past? Yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, so uh, I guess uh, I, might, I might frame my response as being uh, one of the challenges, in fact, that, that Kakadu has always presented to planners, which I, I put I'm actually planned as a Dorothy Dixer, but um, your your question kind of meets the the criteria in in that Kakadu has given the the number of disparate uh, nations and navies that have participated, uh, and from the geographies areas that they've they've all come together off the north coast of Darwin to participate, has always presented some conundrums for exercise planners in terms of where to put vessels, how to, how to split minor war vessels that may not necessarily have certain capabilities, be it sense of fit or weapons, where do you put the major vessels that, that do have uh, uh, much higher capabilities, how do you exercise those higher capabilities for some with sensitive sensors and, and weapons, particularly when submarines are participating. That's always been a challenge for the Kakadu planners. Uh, I saw that firsthand as, as Commander plans. 
Um, and then to, to the point of the question, how do you ensure that everybody gets something from the activity, which is, um, as outlined by our Thai colleague, you know, HADR, which everybody has to deal with at some point, um, subject matter expert exchanges, um, contingency exercises to prepare us for the next, uh, be it international or domestic, um, disaster. Uh, it, it can be done, but it, it, takes, uh, it takes careful preparation in the planning process to um, work out uh, the different dimensions to the exercise, the different geographic locations to conduct those activities. But uh, I guess my, my overall comment is you, you cannot discount the value of getting any number of international navies together in the same place at the same time uh, to do these to do these things, there will always be different nations will always have their own sovereign objectives from an activity, and planners do their best to try and accommodate that. Um, but uh, there is there is value in almost all training, and I think we in Australia have certainly seen over the last two years um, how much our our own defence force is being drawn into support for. Um, disaster relief, be it domestically or regionally, uh, and, and the value, as you've correctly pointed out, in, in actually training for that with other navies, uh, not just ourselves. Thanks, sir. Um, I wouldn't mind going to um, Captain Mario next. Uh, during yours, you talked on quite a diverse range of Malaysian needs and expectations of obviously growing up over 30 years of Kakadu, from uh, force modernisation, accelerating defence diplomacy, deterrence and response, um, and also a keenness to do some observation and benchmarking. So over the time, how do you think your expectations as a, as a Navy have changed of what you want? And have we got the balance right between shore time, experiences that you know, the uh, Admiral Jones was talking about, the, the tabletops and the exercise stuff versus the at sea components. So just some observations or, or where, where future exercise planners might take things. Okay, All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, basically, for Malaysia, I think we are very lucky. Uh, we are in the FPDA. So we got a lot of engagement with the Australians, UK, New Zealand and Singapore. So exercise Kakadu is just uh, an, uh, an additional exercise, but where this exercise is done out of our waters. So there's an additional uh, uh, input there where we have to do uh, what you call logistics and all that. But as you said that uh, uh, it, it, whether it's access uh, FPDA or Kakadu, both of these gives us a lot of, a lot of uh, experience and, and uh, Right now, from where we started, we, we started as just uh, ships participating. Now we have got uh, personnel involved in your planning also. So that, that is the advantage now that we have. That we are now one of your, in, in your planning groups to, to, to conduct these exercises. And when we bring back those experiences back, we, we are able to conduct our own exercises and we, uh, bilateral exercises that we have. So uh, I think we, we are fortunate, very fortunate, uh, compared to the others around the region. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chair, while I'm waiting for a few more to come in online, uh, perhaps you've got some uh, questions of the panel members. Yeah, um, that, that would be great. So I think um, just thinking about the panel, I, I think I might start at the sort of higher end of the strategic environment question. So in a little bit of research I did in, uh, 1993, at the end of the exercise, uh, our Defence Minister, Robert Ray, made a sort of statement stating that after the first exercise of Australian relations with the Asia-Pacific nations were going to be as important um, into the future as they are back in 1993 with the United States of America. And I suppose to put the, uh, the good Admiral to my left here, you know, you can always ask strategic questions of Admirals, that's what they get paid the big bucks for. Um, 
You know, reflecting on that in, in recent years, we've had obviously the AUKUS announcement, we've had announcements of integrated deterrence, we've got US Marines in Darwin and a commitment in the last OSMIN meeting to, to significant increases in force posture with the United States, including more US naval assets at HMAS Sterling and stuff. So I think how does that relate to that growing sort of sentiment from, from Minister Ray way back then and 30 years on and, and sort of how does that reflect to the, I think, the advances you, you laid out in your paper about how Kakadu has, has gone in terms of, of building relations with Southeast Asian nations and how those things balance out against each other. Yeah, it's interesting because um, uh, my comments were on the strategic review of 1993, which talked about uh, regional and, and in particular Asia Pacific uh, importance and regional cooperation. Uh, I, I think every white paper has made similar remarks, um, but it's not a zero sum game. So. Uh, to use the colloquialism, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, having our own activity like Kakadu enables us to bring together nations of our region, which is important to Australia, but it doesn't detract from the fact that our main ally uh, remains, um, and most significant ally remains, the United States uh, of America. Um, what, what is interesting, I think, is that up until 2016, the US was deliberately not invited to Kakadu um, for the very reason that we wish to focus on, on our regional relationships at that activity. Um, I, I don't have the background or, or understanding why the US was invited in, in 2016, um, uh, but, but they were. And uh, to my knowledge, that was the first time they'd, they'd participated. But uh, yeah, I, the crux of my crux of my answer is uh, you don't have to. Uh, it's not one or the other, either or. You can do both. Um, if it's all right, Chair, I'll, I'll, I'll continue over to our Thai colleague. And um, you've ex you, you've been involved in exercises uh, Cobra Gold, as you mentioned in your paper. That's a that's a key part of the engagement that the Royal Thai Navy does. Could you maybe give us an, out, sort of an outline of how Cobra Gold works in relation to what you've heard about Kakadu? Are the, the aims and goals and purpose of, uh, and approach to that similar to the experience of what you as a Navy kind of have one of your key international engagement events that you run? Thank you very much, Peter. Um, talking about my experience in Cobra Gold, um, three times, if I if I if I remember that, um, because of uh, it's a long time ago, um, for my roles in joining Cobra Goals, um, uh, many roles ranging from the uh, navigation officers on the ship uh, to the staff planning officer in a tabletop exercise, and how does it work, <laughs> or? or how that copper gold contributes to our mission. Um, talking about the number first, um, um, we witness the, the, the more participants uh, every time we, 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 we conduct that exercise. And we believe that the number of the participants uh, will continually increasing in the in the future and, um, and in another aspect I think that from that number what can we learn or what is the implication from that I think that in terms of strategic level um, the environment the scary environment today uh, situation situation in the Indo-Pacific change so fast and more players um, come to play and maybe exercise that influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, and I believe that, that a kind of exercise, multilateral exercise such as Cobra Gold that we, we have the experience or Kakadu, uh, I believe that, that this kind of thing is a, a key effective and key mechanism to, to secure 
um, the, the, and stabilize the, the uh, environment, security environment in, in, the, in the Pacific region. This is um, uh, in, in a strategic uh, perspective. Uh, Ivan, I might uh, throw over to you and, and get down. We've talked about uh, exercises and strategy. I might get down to the tactical level for a second. You, you mentioned that you were on the first of the, uh, of the exercises uh, back when you had hair, as you, as you said. Um, I wonder if you can talk to us a little bit about um, you know, what type of vessel were you on a vessel, what type of vessel you served on, what type of activities did you really get involved in? We, Justin mentioned that it was the sort of a division of responsibility for planners. So what did you get involved in? Was it you know, ASW, was it HADR, damage control operations? And in what ways did that really test your crew and your ship and its capabilities and what sort of value from a tactical point of view did you get out of being on this exercise? Right, uh, I was uh, personally involved in uh, Kakadu 2001. So uh, I, uh, we brought the new frigate that was fresh uh, from UK. We came back in 2000, uh, 1999. So the frigate, uh, well, new ship, new toy, everything was singing and dancing. So we joined the 2001 and uh, we had uh, we we were managed we managed to uh, utilize all the equipment on board our ship. Uh, we 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 exercised with your sophisticated ship, and the best uh, I think among the best exercise that we had was uh, the inter, uh, air inter interdiction. So we, we, we managed, uh, I mean, uh, in EWs, and uh, as the air warfare officer, uh, I gained a lot from the air interaction with your, uh, I think uh, your uh, triple ones, F triple ones, were the ones that were F -111 operation at, yeah, at that time. So it was a new new aircraft for us, you know, and it, it really proved our system, uh, one. And uh, besides that, uh, having spent 11 days in Darwin, so I think <laughs> uh, we, we, we were involved in a lot of your cultural activities, one. Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, the engagement between uh, my sailors and uh, the Australians, uh, we had a lot of other activities organized by the Australians for us. So we, 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 get to, we got to know about your culture, that was on social. But on the welfare, Part I think, uh, like any other exercise, uh, the serials that we've gone through, uh, it's, it's, it's packed, uh, it was packed. So, didn't have much sleep, but we enjoyed the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a common theme, I think, being on operations is uh, de deriving as many people as humanly possible of sleep at any one given time. Did you want to? Um, I would like to add my comment to this question. I'm at ta tactical level. Um, everyone may know that, that the RTN is getting a new submarine from, from China. And, and this area, I mean the uh, uh, anti-submarine uh, warfare operation is one of the key areas that we are focusing and um, try to, to develop our capabilities of this. So I think that from the past Kakadu, um, uh, the RTN has especially focused on the uh, uh, anti-submarine warfare operations. And I, I, I talked to the crews uh, that, that they, they said it, it works and they, and they benefit from that. Um, not, just double check, there's nothing from the floor, but um, perhaps, I think Kakadu is getting to a point now, after everything we've learned, we need to introduce more civil military type agency to participate uh, more formally. Uh, open to your comments on that. Not just Australian ones. Yeah, I was going to defer to my colleagues first. I've definitely got a point of view on that. Uh, you, <laughs> you uh, asking uh, if uh, uh, civil agencies were to be involved in this exercise. Would there be an interest? Um, personally, well, as far as I'm, for me, I don't think so. Uh, because uh, uh, we, we don't see the relevance of uh, engagement with your civil uh, authority. Unlike uh, in FPDA, uh, when you come over to Malaysia and Singapore, 
yes, uh, there is there is a requirement for you to know uh, our internal security is uh, by the police. It's not the armed forces. And in the, the Navy, we operate our jurisdiction is more than uh, territorial waters, up to 200 nautical miles. Within territorial waters is the uh, police and the uh, maritime agency. So that would be beneficial for you all if you all come to FPGA. For us, but for us, if we come here, I think there's not much. Uh, you know, we come once, uh, three days to exercise. <laughs> so I, I, I don't see the relevance to having that. Uh, maybe in uh, HADR, yeah, we could, we could. Uh, how, how, how we want, we might want to know how, how does your civil operations uh, come into effect during HADR, besides the military, you know. So uh, in terms of maybe logistic supplies, uh, the rules and regulations, and your your your, your laws. But other than that, if uh, consider us coming here and. Um, wanting to get involved with your civil authorities, I don't think I don't see any relevance to that. Huh? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for for this interesting question. Um, um, the way I, I I would like to to address um, your question is, I would like to share my experience in Thailand about the social media in in Thailand uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, Acquisition. I'm, uh, most of the comments uh, happens in 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 uh, social media in Thailand. Ask us about how the people can get or gain uh, from your acquisition or buying weapons. Uh, can you explain to us which is our um, um, problem? It's kind of problematic and. I would like to, to, to send some, I would like to, to, to talk that. Um, to your question, I think that how, this is our challenge to, to uh, explain to the people that, that the relevance between the material operation and, and the civil operation, civic operation is may, may be good for, for, for the way to explain to the people that, okay, you guys uh, going overseas and do something, and um, maybe it, it is the way, maybe the way to, to explain to the people on shore that 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 how how they gain from from our exercise, something like that. Uh, Admiral Jones, perhaps you've got a perspective considering we've got the integrated campaigning concept as well. Yeah, uh, that's actually what I was thinking of too. Um, I've just come from two years at Joint Operations Command where um, the idea of whole of government is, is certainly no longer a cliche. It's a lived experience in almost all operations we do. Um, it's never just military for Australia anymore in the Australian context. It rarely just military. There's uh, other agencies, government agencies, civilians, public servants involved which might surprise some people, but um, at all levels in almost everything we do, including on the ground in foreign countries. So um, I, I think that, that that is a model for Australia and it is worth uh, showcasing that perhaps in exercises like Kakadu. Re re exercises based around regional cooperation, we always have to have a mind on what other countries that we are inviting to participate want to get out of the activity. But they're also a great way to um, to show how other nations do do business. So I think there's there's absolutely room to um, to do that. And HADR kind of springs to mind, really, given recent experiences. But um, there, there's domestic and international context for that. Um, so you know, even if it was part of in the Kakadu. In the Kakadu way, even if it was part of uh, a topic for the Regional Commanders Conference, um, uh, which you'll be hosting this year, I assume, uh, you might want to do that um, and frame it around HADR and subject matter experts uh, and the like, and and have you know typically at those we invite. Um, I think it's traditionally been 
in the few we've had, you know, academics and think tankers, that's not a bad thing at all. But maybe we could expand that to uh, other agencies, uh, everything from our uh, charitable organisations, world food programs, wh whoever they are, that we do typically connect with on the ground when we're doing HADR work in faraway places. I think there'd be value in that. Okay. Um, I think we might throw to Peter for uh, probably the last question, unless there's any others for the floor. Well, if you, if you don't mind, I'm, I might in, indulge on a, an academic answer to the question, or at least an academic's perspective on the question. And I say this, having in my current and previous roles actually been on some ADF exercises embedded into headquarters and stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll refer initially here to um, the now, unfortunately, late Brendan Sargent, who wrote a really interesting piece only recently before he passed about um, the need for greater strategic imagination. And I think utilising that strategic imagination and, and particularly referencing to Justin's notion about HADR and the importance that our, that our colleagues have placed around that HADR component of these exercises and layering into that the reality of climate change. Like, you know, we often talk in Australia about the, the threat pose, which has been dominated a, a, a bit in our election cycle of late, of, of uh, China in the region. And uh, we, may or, you know, we may or may not get into a, a conflict with that or other countries in the region, but we do know that climate change is happening. We do know it's real and that we do know it's here. So it's, it's a natural strategic reality we're all going to live with. That's going to drive further HADR type operations and the engagement and intersection between those operations and the involvement, as Justin said, of civilian agencies, whether they're domestic civilian agencies or actually international agencies as well. And I think if we have a little bit more strategic imagination and we think about some scenario planning on how we build these exercises, I think there's a, there's a great room to build that in. And it can be either you know, showcasing what we do in Australia, as Justin said, or depending on where the exercise is located in the nearby neighbouring countries, such as Indonesia and other, how we could have a scenario that, that looks at something, say, at the, the border intersection or that crosses over those boundaries where you could actually work across that. And how do you exercise and across civilian exercises interrelated to that? A little bit of imagination around that can easily bring us to a plausible scenario, I think, where particularly for HADR operations, and we've, you know, we've seen historical experience of this with tsunamis and other things that we um, happen in, in the region. So I, my, my personal view, looking at it from an academic strategic policy point of view and, and attempting to do that great crystal ball mysticism that, that those of us in strategic studies do about what the future looks like, <laughs> you know, taking a given like climate change, a given like we've seen the expansion of HADO operations for all militaries around the region, I think that would be a really good way to sh both showcase and also potentially integrate other international agencies into that um, particular effort and well even if it's just in a conversation of how would this work or if you have people from those international agencies well if this was a scenario and you had to be involved what would your perspective what would you be asking the military to do or what would you be asking the governments to coordinate across and I think that's a, a really would be a really interesting way to evolve these series of operations and I kind of look at doing a little bit of reading I think it was the second Kakadu exercise where it started off with you know the fleet coming into harbour is one component of it. It was a slow, steady build of, um, of the exercises amongst the ships until we eventually got to a division of kind of a three-sided potential conflict amongst the different types and capabilities of the fleets. You could easily see that start from a HADR operation then to, well, we know if climate change gets to particular reasons, we could see conflict or competition over resources and stuff. So you could easily, I think, weave that into something with, with non-state actors, as, as was discussed as well, and what role they may play. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we might pause it there, unless there's any last questions. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for uh, panel one. Uh, if uh, those in the audience could please uh, show your appreciation for the, uh, the panel speakers this morning. Okay, the, uh, the uh, conference will take a 30-minute uh, break before we start session two, which is Kakadu Evolves. That will start at 10.30. Thank you very much.